Okay, the Rules Committee will come to order. Um, before we begin, I just want to briefly touch on the horrific attack targeting one of our colleagues and her family that occurred a couple of weeks ago. Uh, my family and I were sickened to hear that someone had broken into Speaker Pelosi's home with the intention of attacking her and violently assaulted her husband, Paul Pelosi. Thankfully, it sounds like Paul is on the road to recovery despite several major injuries, and our continued prayers and support go out to him, Speaker Pelosi, uh, and their entire family. I can't believe I have to say this, but we find ourselves in a time where it must be said uh, violence like this brutal attack is always wrong. Uh, it doesn't matter who the perpetrator or victim is, there is no room for it. And we all must recognize what contributes to an attack of this kind. Lies, conspiracy theories that call for violence, and, and we need to take every single threat seriously. And those of us who find ourselves on this dais um, as leaders, we have a responsibility to tame dangerous and extremist political rhetoric that inspires people to commit such acts of terror. And I want to thank my colleagues who used their platform over the last few weeks to condemn the attack and ask that we in the Rules Committee become a model for America both now and in the future for civility. And even though we sometimes are a place where there's a lot of contention, I do think that, and I credit this to my uh, colleagues on both sides of the aisle and I thank our ranking member, Mr. Cole, I do appreciate the civility uh, in this committee. And I think, um, uh, you know, where I compare it to some of the other committees, um, I think we are, in many respects, a model. So with that said, let's dive into today's business. Uh, this afternoon, our committee will consider S4524, the Speak Out Act. Uh, Non-disclosure agreements, or NDAs, are used to protect sensitive company information when an employee leaves their job. However, over the last several decades, NDAs are becoming more regularly used to silence workplace sexual assault or harassment survivors. That's unacceptable. The Bipartisan Bicameral Speak Out Act prohibits pre-dispute NDAs in cases where sexual harassment or sexual assault has been alleged in violation of federal, tribal, or state law. The Speak Out Act passed the Senate under unanimous consent, and I hope it passes the House with similar margins. Finally, we will also hear a motion to report to the House a new report that my office has put together entitled Any Hunger in America, Challenges, Opportunities, and the Political Will to Succeed. Look, America is a land of abundance, yet hidden in plain sight is the shadow of hunger. Tens of millions of our fellow Americans, including a shocking number of children, do not know where the next meal will come from. Over the last two years, as Chairman of the Rules Committee, I have used my position to convene hearings, roundtables, site visits, discussions, interviews, and more to give voice to those who do not have enough food. The result is this record of innovative solutions from across the nation that built the support for and directly informed the White House Conference on Hunger, Nutrition, and Health that took place this past September. I fervently hope that the findings within this report can be used alongside the Biden-Harris administration's new strategy on hunger, nutrition, and health to find solutions that work to not just manage hunger, but to ensure that food is a fundamental human right for every single American. And, um, and before I yield to my ranking member, Mr. Cole, for any remarks he wishes to make, I should have be begun by saying, welcome back, everybody. It's good to see you. Uh, and now I'll yield to Mr. Cole. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. First, let me begin by associating myself with your remarks about the despicable uh, attack on uh, the Pelosi family, obviously aimed at the speaker, but uh, tragically, the, the violence that uh, was directed at Paul Pelosi is, as you pointed out, absolutely unacceptable, ought to be roundly condemned for what it is. And uh, let me also add that I want to applaud you for your work on the hunger issue and look forward to that uh, uh, being memorialized appropriately and providing a blueprint as we address an issue that uh, you've done so much to uh, work on uh, throughout your entire career in Congress and, and, and have highlighted the issue in ways that I think have been genuinely helpful to millions of Americans and look forward to continuing to work with you on those issues as we go forward. Um, we're here today on a single issue, uh, S4524, that is intended to uh, make pre-dispute, non-disclosure, and non-disparagement uh, contract clauses unenforceable in disputes arising from allegations of sexual assault or uh, sexual harassment. I do want to say for the record, I supported legislation similar to this in the past, certainly intend to support the underlying 
legislation when that comes to force. However, um, we will hear from uh, many of my Republican colleagues on the Judiciary Committee that today's bill might not be as artfully drafted as it, as it could be. There are concerns that the bill will apply to both uh, pre-dispute and pre uh, post-dispute non-disclosure uh, and non-disparagement uh, clauses, which will throw existing settlement agreements into doubt. My Republican colleagues on the Judiciary Committee have expressed concerns that the bill raises important questions about federalism and when Congress should act in an area already occupied by the states, and they've expressed concerns uh, that the bill may force victims of sexual harassment and sexual assault to take their claims to court in a public process, even when private dispute uh, resolution process may be preferable to the victim. Uh, I look forward to hearing those and other concerns today and hope we have a robust discussion on the legislation. Um, perhaps we can find ways to improve it, but again, I certainly support the underlying legislation. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you very much, and I uh, thank you for your opening statement. Um, at this time, I'd, uh, I'd like to offer a motion. Uh, I move that the committee report favorably to the House a report from the Committee on Rules entitled Ending Hunger in America, Challenges, Opportunities, and the Political Will to Succeed. Is there any amendment or discussion? Hearing none, the question is now on the motion that I offered. All those in favor will say aye. 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 Opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the motion is agreed to. Um, thank you. Uh, and now I'd like to welcome our witnesses to provide testimony on S4524, the Speak Out Act. Uh, Subcommittee Chair Cicilline, Representative Massey, we are delighted that you are here. I now recognize the gentleman from Rhode Island, uh, Subcommittee Chairman Cicilline. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. S4524, the Speak Out Act, would prevent the enforcement of pre-dispute non-disclosure and non-disparagement agreements or forced NDAs in sexual harassment and sexual assault disputes. This bipartisan bicameral legislation is simple. It will ensure that any survivor who wants to share their story can. It does so by prohibiting the enforcement of forced NDAs in everyday contracts that silence survivors before a legal dispute even arises. It is unthinkable that widespread sexual misconduct can be covered up and swept under the rug because of NDA snuck into take-it-or-leave-it contracts. And it's unconscionable that millions of people fare risking their livelihood for speaking out about sexual predators. Last year, the Judiciary Committee held a hearing to examine the impact coercive contract provisions like forced arbitration and non-disclosure agreements had on survivors of sexual harassment and assault. One witness, Tatiana Spotswood, testified that her abuser, former Affinity CEO Zia Chisti, used confidentiality clauses in her employment contract to keep multiple instances of overt sexual harassment and violent assault hidden when one of Spotswood's allegations were arbitrated. She testified that, as and I quote, the CEO of the company, he had power over my life and career, and I was anxious not to insult him or make him mad, end quote. And while she received a settlement arbitration, his lawyers offered to give her father a million dollars in addition to her arbitration award to prevent the case from ever becoming public. Ms. Spottiswood was able to come before the Judiciary Committee to testify about Mr. Chisti's abusive behavior and make her story public only after receiving a congressional subpoena compelling her testimony. It is time for this abusive practice to end by enacting the Speak Out Act. This legislation will bring sunlight and transparency to a system that relies on the shadows to hide horrific conduct. It will make our society more just, and it will help end the culture of silence that allows sexual predators to evade accountability. This bipartisan bicameral legislation has already passed the Senate unanimously, and it's supported by a broad coalition of public interest organizations, including the American Association for Justice, the National Alliance to End Sexual Violence, Rallyance, the Army of Survivors, the National Domestic Violence Hotline, and the National Coalition Against Sexual Assault. It's also important to, com to complement H.R. 4445, the Ending Forced Arbitration of Sexual Assault and Sexual Harassment Act, which we enacted earlier this year to restore the right of survivors to have their day in court. I look forward to saying this to the President's desk this Congress and taking another step in our critical and ongoing work to eliminate the forced silence that prevents survivors of sexual misconduct from having their voices heard. I want to thank my colleagues, uh, Congressman Frankel, Congressman Buck, Congressman Jayapal, Griffith, Bustos, and Owens, for their leadership on this issue, and I urge my colleagues to support the bill. Thank you very much. I'm now happy to recognize the gentleman from Kentucky, uh, Representative Massey. Thank you, Chairman McGovern and Ranking Member Cole. 
uh, for allowing me to come and testify on this bill. We agree that no one should be subject to sexual harassment or sexual assault, but this bill has ramifications beyond such claims, and it is a federal overreach that will cause problems down the road. At its core, this bill regulates contracts. It dictates when certain confidentiality clauses are enforceable in court, but this area of contract law has generally been a state law issue, and Congress should not step in. That concern for state sovereignty isn't an abstract or academic either. This is a dynamic area of state law with states actively considering this issue and doing what states often do. They're evaluating or taking different approaches. But by establishing a federal floor, this bill's top-down, one-size-fits-all approach intrudes on state policymaking and cuts off related debates. All that's to say this federalism issue gives me serious pause. At House Judiciary, there was also some question on whether it will even be constitutional in all of its applications, and one commentator raised a similar concern. Beyond these concerns, I think the bill will create other problems down the road. For example, this version includes findings the House never considered or debated. In fact, Democrats intentionally stripped those findings, it seems, from the version the House Judiciary Committee marked up. For example, the bill finds that quote, sexual harassment and assault remain pervasive in the workplace and throughout civil society, end quote. Pervasive, according to one dictionary, means, quote, existing in or spreading through every part of something, unquote. Let me be clear, one act of sexual assault or harassment is too many, but we should at a minimum spend some time studying an issue before we say in federal law that something is pervasive especially since here the findings seem to rely on data that treats misgendering as sexual harassment. Democrats will point back to these findings and they'll tout bipartisan agreement as they try to push any number of other proposals in the future. I also worry that the bill will create misguided pleading incentives because when it's triggered, the bill knocks out confidentiality clauses across the board, subject to a couple ambiguous exceptions. Confidentiality clauses can cover information unrelated to sexual misconduct. But when the bill is triggered, that doesn't matter. The clause is unenforceable unless exceptions are satisfied. So lawyers may, have well, uh, may well have an incentive to satisfy the bill's trigger, again, because the bill is so broad, and they may be tempted to tack on unsupported allegations to do so. To sum it all up, sexual assault and sexual harassment are awful. But this bill is not the right solution. For these reasons, I urge my colleagues to oppose S-4524. I yield back. Thank you very much. I ask unanimous consent to insert in the record a statement of the administration policy in support of S-4524. Without objection. Mr. Cicely, let me just, I just want to ask you a couple of questions. Uh, am I correct? This passed by unanimous consent in the Senate, right? Yes. So that means like, Mitch McConnell didn't object, Ted Cruz didn't object. Josh Hawley didn't, I mean, none of those guys objected. Everybody was okay with it. And if we pass this in the House, does it go directly to the president? So for him to sign into law. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Cole. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Massey, you've become a fixture up here. It's great to see you again. Well, I know on, on this day, uh, everybody's riveted and watching the, the Rules Committee. I just think the you've nation. done such a good job as a witness is that you've been tapped by... Uh, <laughs> by our uh, leadership of that committee to come, and, uh, and you always do a good job. I mean that quite sincerely. It gives, so. it gives me an alibi for the palace intrigue that's occurring right now, <laughs> of which I would be the first suspect. <laughs> well said. Uh, well, I have just a couple of questions for you. Um, I know some uh, uh, judiciary committee, many judiciary Republicans have expressed concerns that as drafted, uh, the bill may have some unintended uh, effect of making confidentiality agreements unenforceable, regardless of when such agreements are made. Can you expand on those concerns and uh, uh, your concerns about, you know, why the legislature may be broader in scope than intended? Well, I mean, this is related to that, uh, the, you know, the perverse incentive that it sets up, because once for attorneys, to claim uh, sexual harassment or sexual assault where the uh, person may not have otherwise done that uh, because it could open the, uh, the whole entire agreement up. Uh, this, this is in some ways acknowledged in the bill that it's going to do that because they've protected trade secrets or proprietary information in the bill. They know that that could be reached through a claim of sexual assault. 
so they've, they've protected that, but you can't anticipate everything. It doesn't protect all confidential things, like the fact that a meeting was occurring between the two parties, you know, uh, that could be commercially interesting to competitors, for instance, or, or other uh, parties. So that's, that's the concern that I see. Okay, and then, um, as you pointed out in your testimony, state laws traditionally govern contract uh, clauses. So to clarify, do you believe uh, congressional action is warranted in this space in any way, shape, or form? I think it would be best left up to the states. In fact, I, you know, I, was, I expressed some concern in my opening statements of, uh, about the broadness of it and what might be defined sexual harassment or sexual assault, so I went to see what the bill uses as the definition. And it actually points to state and tribal definitions, as well as any federal definition. So there's that acknowledgment in the bill that states have different standards already by their different definitions of what those are. So I think if we're going to use the state's definitions, 50 different definitions, I mean, that's, that's an acknowledgment that the states should be in this area and legislating, I think, and not us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're back. Thank you very much, Mrs. Torres. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman, and thank you um, both for being here um, with us. I'm um, <clears throat> really looking forward to uh, delivering this uh, very important bill to the president's desk. Um, I think it's when we look at sexual harassment, um, I, you know, for the record, I want to be clear that it's not a, just a woman's issue. Men are equally uh, as susceptible to sexual harassment as women, the mother of three sons speaking um, here. So either we believe that sexual harassment and sexual violence in the workplace isn't acceptable at any level, or we don't. And I think that this bill acknowledges the fact that states have an opportunity to create their own laws, but at the same time, as a federal government, there is a need for us to protect victims of sexual harassment and sexual violence. For too long, in the film industry, we have seen gross incompetence from companies that have failed to protect their employees simply because they favor a certain actor, a, you know, I say actor <clears throat> as just in a general use, um, not limited to, you know, in the film industry. <clears throat> but they have done, companies have done so much more to protect the abusers that they that, than what they have done to protect the victims. And it is time for us to acknowledge that. And with that, I hope that this will move forward as a bipartisan bill, and I yield back. Thank you. Dr. Burgess. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, <clears throat> let me just briefly associate myself with the remarks of our chairman and ranking member as far as condemning violence against <clears throat> family members of elected officials. No place, no place in our society or our discussion. And Mr. Chairman, congratulations to you for getting your end hunger resolution passed, and I've worked with you in the past on getting nutritional information available to, to more people, and we'll continue to work on that going forward. Um, Mr. Massey, I guess along the lines of palace intrigue, did you not get the memo about the red tie today? I did not get the red tie memo. I, it occurs to me that Mr. McGovern didn't get the blue tie memo. <laughs> My defense. Let me ask you a question, because you, you, you raised the issue on the, on the findings of the bill, and I, I will admit I was startled when I read the, the findings, so I'm, I'm glad you addressed that. Um, in, the, in the section that deals with the continued applicability of state law, uh, it points out that there, nothing in, in, would be done for a state that is at least as protective of the, res the rights of an individual to speak freely. So in your, in your hearings, in the information leading up to this bill, your work on this bill in the committee, were, was there compiled a list of states that are not protective? 
I don't remember that being listed. And so we really don't know if how many states and I, I agree with you. With I do statement. not know. There may be uh, people who do know, but I don't know. And it well, seems it seems to be somewhat of a subjective term. Well, that's I guess where I was going with that. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I agree with you. One case is too many, and and one case is is reprehensible. Uh, one state would be too many, but I, I just wondered if we had an idea as to the scope and the and the reach of the problem. I do not. I'm looking at a map, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. It looks like 12 have some kind of, uh, you know, protection or, or something against non-disclosure agreements, something similar to this federal law, which would be evidence that states could do it. Yes. Uh, Mr. Cicilline advised me <laughs> that there were five. That's a but, total prohibition. Okay. That's right. And then there are some that are some regulated, but the vast majority of states have no regulation or prohibition at all of non-disclosure agreements. Okay. Whether it's five or 12, it looks like uh, state, legislator, state legislatures are capable of legislating on this issue, and it's a dynamic area where there is legislation being offered and debated. And I think that's, as you correctly point out, that is the way things are supposed to work in the states and laboratories of democracy. Absolutely. Um, well, like Mr. Cole, I've supported similar legislation in the past. I just suspect I'm going to be supportive of this as, as it comes through. But it, it is something we need to, I think, keep in mind when we are altering that fundamental contract with the states in the 10th Amendment, uh, why that is occurring and, and what states might do better so that the federal government doesn't have to uh, involve itself in state activities. So thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity. I'm going thank to yield you. back. Mr. Perlmutter. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Gentlemen, thank you for your testimony today. Mr. Cicilline, did you have anything else you wanted to say uh, regarding either Dr. Burgess's question or, or anything else? I thank you for the opportunity. I would say first, with respect to the pervasive uh, findings, uh, just to be clear, the findings detail uh, that doesn't just use the word pervasive. It says, in fact, 81% of women and 43% of men have experienced some form of sexual harassment or assault throughout their lifetime. One in three women has faced sexual harassment in the workplace during her career, and an estimated 87 to 94% of those who experience sexual harassment never file a formal complaint. By any definition, that's pervasive. So I think the findings are well supported by the data that is cited. With respect to this notion of um, state uh, responsibility, states still play an important role here. There are some states who provide greater protection. The state of California has a complete ban on non-disclosure agreements. What this does is it protects a fundamental American value by prohibiting survivor censorship and defending the freedom of survivors to tell their own stories. It's really a baseline. States then can do more, provide additional protection, but this provides a baseline, which is why, in response to a very pervasive problem, this has strong bipartisan and, in the Senate, unanimous support. Thank you. And I guess what I would say, um, in addition to that, is the fact is there hasn't been much experimentation by the states dealing with a very pervasive problem. And at that point, then the Congress should address it. And so I support this legislation. I support the underlying rule that will bring it to the floor, and I yield back to the chair. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Reschenthaler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Massey, would you like to talk about the amendment that was offered to the House companion of this bill? What, the, the amendment to the House version um, had to deal with the proprietary trade secrets and whatnot, um, which I think was adopted in the committee, but it's also in the Senate version, the, the, at least one of the amendments. Okay, thanks. Mr. Cicilline, did you want to add? I concur. 
Okay, sounds good. <laughs> I wasn't sure. All right, thanks, gentlemen. I yield back. See how simple this committee is? <laughs> uh, oh, Mr. Raskin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Cicilline, um, in March, President Biden signed into law um, legislation that we passed to end forced arbitration of sexual assault and sexual harassment claims. And uh, I'm wondering if you would just explain to the committee for everybody's uh, clarification, understanding the relationship between ending forced arbitration and what this legislation would do in terms of liberating people from uh, forced non-disclosure agreements. Uh, yes, thank you for the question. So the legislation we passed already uh, prevented provisions that required people to endure arbitration and give up their right to litigate claims. And so lots and lots of people were signing documents that waived the right to redress a grievance without even knowing it and be forced into this private uh, proceeding, which is expensive, where the rules of evidence don't apply, and very often people cannot avail themselves of any justice in that system. Uh, we heard throughout that debate that one of the big problems was uh, these non-disclosure agreements where people were prevented from speaking about what had happened, which is an important way to hold perpetrators accountable. And so this is really an important companion piece to that to ensure that survivors get to make the decision about when to speak about this and if to speak about this, and really empowering the survivors and holding the perpetrators of sexual assault and sexual violence accountable, particularly that I would say in my 14 years here, we had the most compelling hearing I've ever seen in the Judiciary Committee from survivors of sexual assault and sexual violence in the workplace, which really demonstrated the devastating impact that these non-disclosure agreements or provisions have on the survivors of sexual assault and sexual abuse. Well, one of the things I remember from that hearing that you just um, mentioned, Mr. Cicilline, was discussion of the fact that um, that Hollywood producer Harvey Weinstein built into all of his contracts a non-disclosure um, agreement provision. So it's almost as if he was planning his assault of women around uh, this legal formula for silencing is victims. Um, a bunch of states have already taken action to deal with this problem. Isn't that right? And isn't uh, Congress, in essence, following on a dozen or more states who have already identified this as a problem? Yes, I, I, this problem exists in every state in the country. There have been a dozen or so states that have taken some action, uh, but it means that in a majority of states in this country, there is no protection against this pernicious practice of silencing uh, survivors of sexual assault and sexual violence. And this has been a longstanding problem and Congress congressional action is long overdue. Great, well, I just want to say, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm thrilled that we're bringing this forward with uh, dispatch and we need to strike a serious blow against sexual harassment and sexual assault in the workplace. And this is a, a great way to do it. And I want to thank Mr. Cicilline for his leadership and I yield back. Thank you very much, Ms. Scanlon. Thank you. Um, first, I would like to associate myself with the chairman's remarks uh, condemning the attempted assault on Speaker Pelosi and the actual assault on her husband. Um, with respect to the bill we're talking about, the Speak Out Act, uh, like Mr. Cicilline and, and Mr. Raskin, I participated in the judiciary hearings, and I was hoping you could just speak for a moment about um, why it's so important that we not silence um, survivors of this kind of harassment. Um, what does compelling disclosure do for the situation? Well, obviously for the survivors of sexual assault and sexual violence, part of the um, process of, of holding your perpetrator accountable is to share that information publicly, to call them out and make uh, those horrific actions uh, public knowledge. It's also a very important way, way to warn a future potential uh, victims of, of sexual assault or sexual violence who may work in the same workplace, who may have contact with the same individual. So, you know, we have a very important priority here, ensuring that people who are, uh, you know, survivors of this kind of despicable practice, I mean, think about it, you're, the vict you're a survivor of sexual assault and sexual violence, you've already gone through an unspeakable event, and you're prevented from sharing with anyone, um, which is sometimes the best way to prevent it from reoccurring, either against you or another person. So there, there are 
both in terms of the individual, it's important for accountability and to process uh, and to hold that person accountable, but it's also important to prevent future harm to other individuals as well. And I think we heard some evidence concerning the fact that the act of sharing it um, basically destigmatizes what has happened to the folks who are already survivors and encourages other people who may have had the same um, conduct to come yeah, there, forward. There's an enormous amount of research that shows that very often the failure to disclose a sexual assault or sexual violence is a result of people feeling responsible in some way, which of course is not the case, and removing that stigma so that people are free to speak candidly and openly about what their experience was and how uh, they have survived that experience is really critical. Well, I'm, I'm looking forward to passing the Speak Out Act as we pass the prior act uh, regarding uh, forced arbitration. Uh, that'll mean that this Congress will have passed two bills to address the destructive and unfair legal tactics that corporations and businesses have used to silence survivors of sexual assault and harassment and to cover up bad and sometimes criminal behavior. Um, it's heartening to see that Congress has been able to come together on these uh, reforms. Uh, as mentioned by a couple of our members so far, uh, this passed the Senate unanimously. I see no reason that it shouldn't pass the House unanimously as well. It's a major step forward um, for survivors in the workplace, and I look forward to sending the bill to President Biden's desk. Thank you. Thank you. I yield back. Uh, Ms. Ross. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and um, I also want to associate myself with your remarks about the vicious attack on um, Paul Pelosi and and on the speaker, and um, want to just echo, I think, the feelings of most people that um, no one should have to experience that, and the incredible strength and grace the speaker has shown um, since that attack, and our prayers are with Paul Pelosi. Um, I also want to thank Mr. Cicilline for bringing this bill forward and for the, um, for the sponsors. In the United States, businesses too often cover up sexual assault and harassment in order to maintain their reputations. Individuals who are victims of sexual assault and abuse in the workplace can be coerced into silence through non-disclosure agreements signed just before the commencement of their jobs. In the last decade, more victims than ever have broken that silence to fix this faulty system that uses secrecy to protect predators and silence survivors. Our laws should work to curb practices that they, they should work to curb the practices that enable the abuse of these individuals, and we need to do this nationwide, which is why Congress should act and not just leave it to the states. NDAAs work against efforts co to combat sexual assault and harassment in the workplace. As we've heard, uh, movie producer Javier Weinstein used NDAs to evade accountability for allegations of sexual harassment and assault for decades. The Speak Out Act prohibits predisputes, NDAs, and in instances where sexual harassment or sexual assault has been alleged in violation of federal, tribal, or state law, and in a situation in which survivors wish to break their silence. This legislation will ensure that the American workplace is safer, more inclusive, and more respectful for all of our citizens. I look forward to supporting this bipartisan bill and the rule. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any other questions or comments? Hearing none, I want to thank uh, Mr. Cicilline, Mr. Massey, for, uh, for being here. I uh, appreciate your testimony, and you're free to go. Are uh, there any other members who wish to testify on S4524? Seeing none, this closes the hearing on S4524.
45, uh, S4524, the Speak Out Act, a closed rule. The rule provides one hour of debate equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the committee on the judiciary or their designees. The rule waives all points of order against consideration of the bill. The rule provides that the bill should be considered as read. The rule waives all points of order against provisions in the bill. The rule provides one motion to commit. The rule provides that at any time through the legislative day of November 18th, 2022, the speaker may entertain motions offered by the majority leader or a designee that the House suspend the rules with respect to multiple measures that were the object of motions to suspend the rules on the legislative day of November 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th, or 18th, 2022, on which the yeas and nays were ordered and further proceedings postponed. The chair shall put the question on any such motion without debate or intervening motion and the ordering of the yeas and nays on postponed motions to suspend the rules with respect to such measures is vacated. The rule provides the proceedings may be postponed through November 18, 2022 on measures that were the object of motions to suspend the rules on the legislative days of November 14 or November 15, 2022, and on which the yeas and nays were ordered. Section four of the rules provides that on any legislative day during the period from November 21st, 2022 through November 28th, 2022, the journal of the proceedings of the previous day shall be considered as approved. The rule provides that for the duration of the period addressed by section four, the speaker may appoint members to perform the duties of the chair and that each day shall not constitute a calendar day for the purposes of Section 7 of the War Powers Resolution, a legislative day for purposes of Clause 7 of Rule 13, or a calendar or legislative day for purposes of Clause 7C1 of Rule 22. Finally, the rule provides that House Resolution 1463 is hereby adopted. I yield back. Thank you very much. You heard the motion from the gentleman from Pennsylvania. Is there any amendment or discussion? Mr. Cole. Uh, if not, uh, uh, is there any other member, uh, no, no other amendments or discussion hearing none? The question is now on the motion offered from the gentleman from Pennsylvania. All those in favor will say aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. All those opposed say no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. Uh, all right. Uh, the motion is agreed to. The, uh, the gentleman is asked for a recorded vote. The clerk will please call the roll. Mrs. Torres. Aye. Mrs. Torres, aye. Mr. Perlmutter. Aye. Mr. Perlmutter, aye. Mr. Raskin. Aye. Mr. Raskin, aye. Ms. Scanlon. Aye. Ms. Scanlon, aye. Mr. Morelli. Mr. Desaunier. Aye. Mr. Desaunier, aye. Ms. Ross. Aye. Ms. Ross, aye. Mr. Negroos. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Cole, no. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Burgess, no. Mr. Rushenthaler. Mr. Rushenthaler, no. Mrs. Fishbach. Mr. Chairman. Aye. Mr. Chairman, aye. Uh, Corporate report the total? Seven yeas, three nays. And the uh, ayes have the motion is agreed to. Accordingly, Ms. Scanlon will carry it for the majority. Ms. Fishback will carry it for the minority. Without objection, the Rules Committee is adjourned. What? Oh, and we're.